I wanted to ask how many of you mistrust the media in general for showing you truthful pictures? So that's about half, that's not bad. Um, so the rest of you, I assume, trust everything you see? <laughs> Somewhere in the middle in there, I guess. Uh, how about, how many of you actually edit your photographs for school or for work or for some other cause? How many of you use Photoshop or at least uh, edit pictures, put them on social media? Not that many. Just a few. Okay. Um, how many of you know someone who's manipulated? Don't point. <laughs> well, let's... Uh, I, I, bring that, I bring the manipulation side up because there's a personal side. Uh, usually there's more people that raise their hands when they, when they talk about uh, editing your own pictures. There's a personal side to manipulation, and it tends to be used pejoratively. And, and when we talk about the media, of course, media manipulation is a very negative term for the same concept <coughs> of editing or, or changing your pictures, for making them look as good as you want them to look or as good as the magazine wants them to look. Uh, and when, when they cross the line, uh, for whatever reason, if we don't agree with the, the picture or they've done some other, other uh, edit to the picture that, uh, and we'll see examples that, that the public doesn't like, then we say, okay, the ma they're manipulating the picture and we don't like it. But it's a big gray area. We all walk that tightrope when we, when we edit our pictures. And uh, some, it usually reflects our own unresolved dilemmas with, this, with the larger ethical issues we, we come across just about every day. So, let's, uh, so uh, I mentioned that uh, there's three aspects to considerations of ethical, uh, ethical issues when you're involved in the media. And I'm going to talk mostly about still images, completely about still images. So I don't, I don't have experience or videos uh, up here for TV. Actually, I have one video. But uh, I'll confine it to my, my level of, of expertise and what I've been doing. But when you're shooting, you, you deal with the subjects. You have to approach, approach a subject carefully sometimes. It depends on whether you're in a controversial event of some sort. And there's been plenty of them in, in different cultures. You have to be a little aware of, of nonverbals and all, all those modes of uh, communicating that uh, a lot of us tend to forget <coughs> sometimes. Uh, so once you've taken the shots and collected everything, then you sit down at the computer and you, you're editing and you have to keep in mind uh, what might be fair to the subject. You have trade the trade-offs between, say, personal expression versus the common good. These are very major philosophical issues that have been discussed throughout time. And we are still wrestling with those, those concepts, both politically, socially, within our communities and within ourselves, how much our own desires supersede those of maybe this, the community we're in, or, or whatever your community or the world, however large you want, you want to think it. And then you have issues of displaying uh, the, the photographs. Um, in many ways, Display may be the most important issue because it really, when you think about it, taking a picture doesn't really mean much unless you're going to show it to someone. So you're always keeping that in mind. Where is this going to appear? And you can you can use that when you're talking to, say, a subject that might be a little bit hesitant to have you take their photograph. Uh, you may have to tell them, look, this is this is not going to appear. And, a worldwide publication, or it's not going to go online. Uh, so that sometimes you can you can soothe your your subjects by kind of cutting to the chase a little bit and and discussing that with them. Has anybody had anyone ask them not to take a picture of them? Anybody been in a controversial event, a cultural event, a religious event, something where the subjects it just felt awkward if you raised your camera. Nobody? A couple people. Was there a way that you got around that? Did you just not take pictures? Or did anybody figure out a way that you could actually take the picture that you wanted? Nobody kind of pushed through that a little bit? OK, that's interesting. Um, 
Well, uh, I always tell people I don't care if you're carnivores or vegetarians, we're all media eaters, and we are bombarded every day, every minute, with some form of, of media images. And whether we're conscious or unconsciously uh, aware of it, uh, there is something behind the images that either has been thought about by a committee, a magazine, or even a newspaper. Um, and especially advertising. We're all very aware of sublim subliminal messages and advertising. And all the money and time that's spent with advertising images trying to seduce you and persuade you to buy their products. So the more you're aware of these things, the more uh, you can at least look at images and at least keep in mind, okay, am I, am I really seeing what they want me to see or am I seeing something a little more objective? I'll get a little more specific about that uh, a little bit later. Now anybody who says that we don't like being deceived is lying. We love being deceived in many different ways, but we tolerate it. And, of course, magic, we go there thinking we're going to be deceived, and that's the challenge, is to find out uh, where, where the truth is. Um, comedy, we're led along one mode of, of thought, and they kind of hit us with a zinger at the end that we didn't expect. So we tolerate certain forms of deception. We tolerate it in advertising, like I mentioned. Most of us probably realize that that's a composite. They're not that close. Um, but it's no big deal. We expect it. So, why do, why does the media bother us, basically? Because we're looking for some form of truth in what they're telling us, whether it's for journalistic purposes or other reasons. There, there's a lot of other media that, that we are expecting to tell us the truth, even if it's not a, a newsy event. A lot of times we need the media for survival, whether we're deciding to vote next month, or all kinds of other reasons. Uh, we feel vulnerable when we don't have all the information, so we're looking at them to give us information. And it might not be a survival reason, it could be something as mundane as, as what's at the supermarket or, or whatever it might be. But we have a little bit of vulnerability, and we're looking for something that can move us along without us having to say, wait a minute, are they, are they lying to us? And it all comes down to trust and credibility. So various forms of media engender or require our trust, and other forms, we kind of give them a lot of rope, like advertising, and we'll see a few others uh, in a little bit. So digital has changed some of these boundaries, but not all of them. And what used to be seeing is believing uh, ever since the invention of, of photography and ways of recording words and images, we have been taught to believe what we read and see. Now we all know that's not true completely, but we're living in a different age where we've had a lot of different transgressions through the years. But the people, even hundreds of years ago before photography, if something was written down, we accepted it as the truth. So in the digital age, with the speed of what, the way we can um, detect falsehoods, there's this shifting credibility and more reliance on the credibility of the photographer than the photograph. There's some great uh, TED Talks uh, online about the new currency of credibility in the digital age, in the new millennium. Um, I think I have the names here, Rachel, um, Rachel Menard and Rachel Botsman. And you can come see me this, uh, later if uh, you want some links. But you can look under TED Talks and they talk about how we depend on the credibility, on credibility in general to succeed in business and in our personal affairs and just about everywhere, more so than we ever have before. And some of the most successful businesses have been built on social media, on one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, millionaires have been made based on their truthfulness and their credibility. So again, I've kind of talked about what do we tolerate. Are we part of the problem? Anybody who's used social media, who puts pictures of either themselves or their friends, uh, 
online in any way to advertise business or um, to get things done in their lives for whatever reason, we want to look as good as we can. And we usually do that through uh, either images online or when we pick out senior pictures, we choose with the photographer your best shots. Uh, there's nothing necessarily unethical about that. But when you have something like social media that has mushroomed the way it is, and some of the legal problems that they've had with people showing false pictures or illegal pictures, people showing crimes being made and so forth, then you have a certain, you have crossed the line in many ways. Whether or not they actually violate a law, there are still ethical morals that most societies will, will accuse them of. So, so social media, there's a long-standing debate in photographic circles, whether photographers or artists are windows or mirrors. Uh, they're either mirroring their own feelings about a particular event, or they're a window looking out and showing you what society, in whatever community they're in, is showing. And again, the origins, the origins are, in many ways, making ourselves look as good as we, as we can. So it's not necessarily bad. It gets back to whether we think they're, they're uh, being ethical in their, in their judgments. When we, when we talk about opinions, uh, we value people's opinions, whether it's social media or wherever. But when they cross the line, kind of like the difference between manipulation and editing, then we say they're so judgmental. But really, it's the same concept. So where do you draw the line? And I, there's not too many people, I guess, here in this group that have been confronted in situations. I've been in, in several situations where, uh, not several, there's been maybe three or four in my life where I've been, I've been asked not to photograph in public situations. And I've had to make the choice whether, uh, whether or not to photograph in respect to whoever it is that's asking me that. If there really is a legitimate reason, I, I won't photograph. Or if there's something personal that with them not liking the photograph, where there's a greater good to continue photographing in, in the community. And it's a fine line. I mean, sometimes I've, I've been in a uh, uh, Muslim country where a guy pulled me aside and said, no, you can't photograph. You can't photograph here. And I had already been shooting there for days, actually. So there wasn't any issue of actually photographing. And what I was shooting was not, was in crowds. And so, so I decided, no, it's OK to keep photographing. And everything was fine. It never escalated. He left, and, and nothing ever happened. I normally I would probably say okay no problem I'm a, I'm a foreigner in a, in a foreign land and I can I will respect that but it doesn't always have to be and uh, one or two times uh, a similar situation has happened in the U S where I'd be photographing in a public area this was in Portland one time uh, there's a chess tournament going on very benign in the middle of downtown Portland I'd been shooting for about 15 20 minutes on my own, not for a, a magazine or anything. And uh, somebody, he, one of the guys standing next to me said, uh, you can't take pictures here. And I thought, OK, I've been here for quite a while. And nobody else cared. And, I, and he wasn't even part of the chess player or anybody else. And uh, I decided to talk with him a little bit. I said, look, it's a public place. Uh, I won't take your picture. Uh, everything's cool. Nobody else minds. Um, so I'm going to keep taking pictures. And it, and it defused quite nicely. It was not an issue. It could have been an issue. I know plenty of photographers who have escalated things and, and it gives the rest of us a bad name. Kind of. But again, it comes down to a one-on-one -on -one and being aware maybe of what your rights are. A lot of times it has nothing to do with rights. Uh, it just has to do with, with talking to somebody who might be worried, trying to figure out what their fear is, talking to them about where where the photograph might or might not be published at all, uh, maybe what inspired you to photograph in that situation, and maybe they can you can kind of create a little a bond with them. So, um, so we get on to some of the issues of shooting. Now, how many of you would take this kind of a picture? This is in Hong Kong. That's the same skyline. This has been set up because usually there's so much pollution there 
that they found people appreciated just taking a nice picture and moving on. So I'm curious, how many of you would take that picture instead of maybe the real skyline? It's a, fog, a smoggy day, foggy day. Nobody? A couple people would. The rest of you would take the picture of the of the skyline, the real skyline. Is that right? I don't know. It's been very popular there. That's you can find these on Google. A lot of the times I get some of these on Google. But it does it does raise the questions of what you consider an ethical real depiction of reality. And many times they somebody might be visiting a city and they're there for maybe an hour or two or three and the entire city fully polluted and they won't get a, a nice picture of the skyline and maybe they're walking around and the skyline all of a sudden beautifully appears for two minutes and then it disappears so there's there's no fine uh, no real answer here it's, it's a, a moving line and it's the same ethics is is the same in many other situations it's like nailing jello to the wall you know sometimes you, you just have to find a, a, a bigger nail or a different support you find support for your particular ethical position, whether it's something as benign as taking a, a photograph that might not be real at the moment, but finding some other way that you could justify it for yourself. Now, every now and then I like to show graphs. Um, in class, the artists, artists love graphs. As soon as the graph comes on, they pull out their cell phones and start tweeting and so forth. But it's interesting to do some correlations because uh, as, as a business owner, uh, for a long time, I've definitely had to correlate a lot of different things for your, for your finance. Can anybody tell me what this is a graph, a graph of? Anybody have an idea? It is a graph of something. I don't have the units. Either. No guesses? Oh, what's that? It doesn't have any labels. It doesn't have labels, that's yeah. true. But sometimes you don't need labels. Okay. It's two two things that are opposite each other. You got it. It's an inverse relationship. Okay? So that's that's all you need to know about this one. Because I used to do all kinds of graphs like this, and this is something I happen to notice through the years that when my sales went down, my blood pressure was up. So I thought this is kind of neat, you know, maybe I can correlate things that aren't normally correlated. And it works out really well with some, some for this particular uh, issue. So I noticed, or throughout history, and especially the recent history since digital, as technology has improved, as the resolutions have gotten finer and finer <coughs> on cameras, on printers, the ethical boundaries have actually blurred. We're, we're much better off at detecting falsehoods. We're, we're, everything happens on a much faster uh, speed. So. Uh, you can make a general correlation like this and take it even one step further in that as our, as our awareness has grown, the credibility of photography has gone down, which I've already talked about. So this is nothing new. You might think, well, this is because of digital, this is because of increased discussion about ethics or whatever. This has been going on for a very long time. Uh, this is a picture of a Frenchman in Hippolyte Baird. Most people don't know, but he actually developed the, the modern process of, of photography uh, before Louis Daguerre in France. Daguerreotypes were normally what you hear about as the first commercial process for producing latent images on some sort of substrate. Daguerre did it with copper. But Hippolyte Baird was actually developing it a few years before him, and he was about ready to bring his processes to the patent office in Paris, and he was actually persuaded by, unbeknownst to him, one of Louis Daguerre's friends to hold off, and I forget the reason why, but he said, okay, I'll wait a little bit. Um, and in that time, Louis Daguerre snuck in, kind of got his patent made, and became world famous for, for developing uh, photography, for developing what became the modern process of photography. So in retaliation, Hippolyte took a picture of himself, and he said that this is the first portrait, and only portrait, of a drowned man. And I think I have, oh, I have it. Oh, 
I'll read you what he wrote on the back of this picture. The corpse which you see here is that of Monsieur Baird, inventor of the process that has just been shown to you. As far as I know, this indefatigable experimenter has been occupied for about three years with his discovery. The government, which has, has been only too generous to Monsieur Daguerre, has said that it can do nothing for Monsieur Baird, and the poor wretch has drowned himself. Oh, the vagaries of human life. He has been at the morgue for several days, and no one has recognized or claimed him. Ladies and gentlemen, you better pass along for fear of offending your sense of smell. For as you can observe, the face and hands of the gentleman are beginning to decay. So he, he published this, and then he went into hiding. And he stayed out of public sight for, for quite a while, I think it was several months before he showed himself again. This is probably the first recorded image of deception. Now, he did nothing manipulative to the picture. So this is more of a, of a deception in words and stories. But it's still the first use of a photograph where the expectation of truth was there. Um, Abraham Lincoln. How many of you think this is Abraham Lincoln? I, I got you for a warning now. It's Abraham Lincoln's head. Um, but it's on John Calhoun's body. So one of the most famous pictures of Abraham Lincoln, and it's not him. John Calhoun was the uh, senator from North Carolina or South Carolina. I think it was South Carolina. Um, so this had to be do, done with cutting and pasting, negatives, positives. I don't exactly know how they did it, but it was not easy in those days. Uh, this is uh, another French photographer, Alain de Torbache. Obviously composited, but here it is in 1860, uh, 1880, excuse me. Uh, so uh, right there, people are beginning to see some of the possibilities with deception, for lack of a better word. This is uh, jumping ahead 100 years. Yves Klein, I don't know why the Frenchmen are really into this. Uh, Yves Klein was known as, uh, has been known as an art photographer. This is in Paris, and he took this picture. Um, but he had all kinds of other composites set up. So he had a whole troop of people. He did composites, and it was actually uh, relatively easy there. When you have a shot like this, you don't have to worry about cutting out individual people. You can pretty much cut right across there. And he may have had a third image too that I think he included something in there and I can't remember what it was. But this is already in the 60s, so we're already up to you know present day uh, photographic media manipulations. Uh, Museum of Modern Art had an exhibit about three, four years ago and just on fake photographs before 1980. So there's enough there to make a whole exhibit. And if we had time, we could look at quite a few other ones. They're not confined to this country. There are very famous shots of uh, Soviet ambassadors that have been airbrushed out uh, when the Soviet presidents at the time, uh, I think there's one, I can't remember the name of the one I just saw, but uh, they, the Soviets were very well known for taking out people that did, in a picture if there was some later disagreement, even however slight. They were very concerned about any sort of uh, reputation in any, any picture. So, uh, I'll show a few more modern shots in, in advertising. We'll start with them because they're easy to pick on. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, shots that came up a few years ago was of Michelle Pfeiffer on the cover of Esquire. The, um, the, the title of the the story, and on the front cover, said that what Michelle Pfeiffer needs is absolutely nothing. And then it came out later that they actually had to pay a retoucher and a makeup artist combined about $1,500 to produce the shot. So Esquire lost a little bit of cred there. Um, again, we take certain ads for granted, so we figure, okay, big deal. Um, they're funny for a while. And 
I don't know what they're trying to sell having a lion with a rifle. I, I miss a lot of the inner discussions on those. But it captures your eye and maybe that's all they want. If they can stop you from flipping through the pages, uh, it works. Uh, this, is, this is one of mine. I just wanted to mention that um, it's not always the photo that's manipulated. It could be, and this shot has been printed uh, all over the world just the way it is. Sometimes they flopped it, but they have, it has never been modified, uh, retouched in any way that I know about. Um, and it's my, been my best-selling uh, wildlife shot, at least, for a long time. It ended up uh, one time on a cover of Land's End, and this was the only time that I was pissed off at an editor or whoever made the decision to cut off the nose, cut off the ears. Uh, maybe turn it into a square format, whatever. It, it, you know, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad they used it, but I, I thought it completely took away from from the reason I took the picture. What's interesting is that the shot here is an Art Wolf shot. If, if some of you might rec recognize that, I think he has it on the cover of one of his books. And it came out later that that this particular shot has been heavily manipulated beyond what anybody, any photographer or most people would agree to. Uh, Art admitted that he had cloned zebras and he moved them around and he wanted to emphasize the pattern and the beauty of nature that he saw. So it, it kind of popped a balloon in my mind with some of, some of his shots. Um, in an advertising context, maybe it doesn't matter really. It's, it's representing a concept. Uh, that's, that's probably the major difference when you start working for corporations and advertising, you're switching from subject to concept. And anything that illustrates the concept is usually fair game. Nikon had a series of ads. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember some of the ads for the Nikon School of Photography. Anybody remember that at all? Nobody. They were great ads. They would take normal shot stock photographs that, that almost anybody could have taken, and they pair them up with some reason to go to their Nikon school. I don't know if you can all read that, but it says, use a high-speed film for dim subjects. They had, um, and I took some of their classes too, they were mostly um, homeschool classes. Uh, try a zoom lens when photographing the nature. Somebody got a little too close to a kangaroo. So I don't think these ads are manipulated in themselves, but obviously, uh, maybe they put the camera in there. I don't know but we don't, we don't really care. So, even newspapers can kind of stretch the limits a little bit. If it was a story uh, that they were depicting something else, I, don't, I doubt if they didn't probably didn't modify the picture at all, but they play around with, with words again. What this brings up, though, is that there's just as much mistrust or misleading deception in the, in the words, the captions, the disclosures around the picture as there can be in the picture. And they've gotten into a lot of, a lot of heat, a lot of media, not just newspapers. Uh, this is probably one of the most famous problems that, that a magazine ran into. And I'm mostly probably remember these uh, from a while ago. In the 80s, in the 80s, 90s, I can't remember. As soon as Newsweek and Time got a hold of the mugshots of OJ, they published them on their cover. Newsweek ran the ran the shot pretty much the way it, it came into them. Time decided to basically editorialize it. They made it darker. Uh, they made OJ look guilty. And they tried to defend their position. They tried to say, well, we wanted to reflect what was overwhelmingly in the public's um, attitude about OJ. Uh, we don't feel we did anything wrong. Uh, but they lost a lot of credibility for this. Most people pretty much disagreed with Time's reasoning. But the issue that this brought up is how much manipulation is acceptable, again. And I, one of the Newsweek editors made a comment that, uh, oh no, it was on another one. I'll show you, I'll show you another one later. Um, but it relates, it actually relates to this. He said that uh, of their manipulation, they didn't modify it enough. In other words, there's just enough modification there where maybe half their readers, maybe three quarters, I don't know what the percentage, would think, oh, that's the way he really looks. And when it's on a cover, the covers are subject to a much higher level of scrutiny, a higher code of ethics, because anybody can see the cover. 
And most of the time you walk by and for one or two seconds you see a cover and you move on. Children can see the cover. Uh, there's a lot more involved there uh, with either legalities or ethical uh, guidelines. So you can't always explain away something on the inside pages to somebody who happens to see the cover. Another magazine went through and modified OJ. I don't know why they made him look the way they did, but it's obviously been manipulated more so probably than the time cover. So I think most people seeing this shot would say, okay, I don't, they're playing with it, I want to read the story. Or they're playing with it, I don't care about the story. But then they put believing is seeing, and I guess it, it makes you curious a little bit, uh, a little play with, with words. But in this case, I don't think they got any criticism for this, maybe, maybe from OJ. Uh, this is this is an issue of a, a, a photograph that was modified, but in ways that we all modify pictures. So The Economist is very successful, the most su uh, popular online and print weekly news magazine. It superseded Time and Newsweek in the last year or so as being the most read magazine. So they took a picture of Obama. This was during the uh, the Gulf spill, and looks like a normal picture. Um, but in reality, they cropped him in a way that gives you a whole different feeling for what he's going through. In the first shot he looks, the shot they used, he looks alone. You don't know what he's pondering. Uh, even the title of damage beyond the spill, it makes you seem like he's alone in, in any of his any of his policies or whatever. And the real shot shows that it really has nothing to do with that. He's discussing things with the Coast Guard and, and another lady there. Um, whole different feeling just from a crop picture. Uh, Associated Press and a lot of news agencies say that they will not crop pictures. Whatever we send them, uh, they're going to use the way it is, uh, or they're going to send it on to the magazine or whoever's asking for it, the newspaper, the way we've shot it. So, once again, when as a photographer, and if you're shooting and you submit something somewhere, you really have no control how it's going to be used. Nobody would, they, would blame the photographer here um, for what they did, but it does become annoying if, if, if you have any sort of moral fiber as a photographer that you want your pictures to represent what you, what you shot and the way, the way you intended them to be. So um, this was The Economist's um, defense sometimes, and you can, when you read through this, you'll see that there's contradictions in what they say. Um, they say that that we removed the lady, not to make a point, but because an unknown woman would have been puzzling to the readers. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. It sounds like they're just grasping for straws. But they, you know, it's 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 okay to remove maybe something that might distract or something's in the way uh, for maybe some other reason. But to say puzzling, uh, I have no idea. That to me, right away, indicates that they're trying to cover up the real reason, which was that they wanted to show Obama kind of alone or whatever there, whatever it was. Um, then they went ahead and said, we often edit the photos we use on our covers, uh, sometimes to produce a joke. We don't edit photos in order to mislead. So it, it raises the question of what is misleading. Is misleading bad? Can it be good? And one of the questions we go through in, in the media ethics class is, uh, is it okay to mislead if there's a greater common good involved. And that's something I wish we had more time. I love that, that kind of discussion. It will crop up in many different situations. But photographs, uh, and we'll see some a little bit later. You'll see a short little movie mm -hmm. clip that talks about that. Um, and then on the bottom, of course, they say the ideal metaphor for a politically troubled president. So they basically are good. Right, that's what they wanted to do. So when is disclosure necessary? When should a, a, a media, a magazine, a newspaper, whatever is publishing for the public, disclose that they, they've manipulated, edited a picture. And this has gone round and round for decades. Because every time somebody comes up with a code of ethics or a, a proposal for the government to regulate the media, it gets shot down. It's, it's not in our constitution for that to happen. And yet, it's very misleading. 
uh, again, if you go back to the, one of the first slides, we rely on the media for very important decisions. And many times, and this is my opinion, we need to know the truth. People expect certain media to tell us the truth all the time. And when they don't, when one form of media violates that trust, it affects them all. Time Magazine again. Um, and there's the quote at the bottom, but it's, you know, I had the words in, in white, but they're, in, uh, they're in black here. It says, cover photograph by David Hume, tear by Tim O'Brien. This is on the inside of the cover, or uh, one of the inside pages. So they added the tear, but they disclosed it. So maybe they're covering themselves, I don't know, but how many people are going to walk by that cover and have a whole new impression of Reagan, good or bad? Um, so they disclosed it. Well. That doesn't always work. National Geographic has been guilty of the same thing. Um, this was their, their greatest transgression, lost them tons of credibility. Um, not only, well, the, the first photo is the original photo taken by the photographer, who, by the way, asked the camels to walk by and the camel owners to walk by again, because he missed it the first time. So that part was set up. And then uh, the story goes, that the, the issue for that month already had a cover photo, and it was a cover of the Dalai Lama, and I forget what the event was or why they were, they were profiling, but they received a lot of complaints from the Chinese government, a lot of, I don't want to say threats, but a lot of pressure to remove the Dalai Lama's face from their cover. At the last minute, they decided to remove the cover, and they're scrambling for another shot they found uh, this guy's uh, Gahan Shah. So they had very little time to put it all together. And they, they completely repositioned everything. They did everything uh, in their labs to make the, the horizontal picture fit the vertical format. Very hard to see on this one, but obviously you can, you can get a pretty good idea that there's been one or two camels in the front here. And they, they enlarged things and moved them around so you have pyramids of the camels. True to the original concept, maybe, but not the actual shot. And my favorite defense that one of the editors gave was he said that we simply retroactively repositioned the photographer. <laughs> it didn't work. They didn't, nobody bought it, but that's, that was what they tried to get out of. Um, So that was the first time that they took a huge hit for that. We're still showing this picture, you know, 40 years later. So uh, obviously, uh, we're still taking some, some heat from it. Um, a little closer to home, 1988, six years later. This was sh shot right in Portage Lake, Portage Glacier. Um, and I was around for that. In fact, the photographer that shot it, Chris Johns, is now the, uh, the editor, the photographic editor, I think. He's either man, uh, chief editor or photographic editor. Um, a bunch of us were ticked off at this photo. It's not a realistic photo. They didn't, as far as I know, they didn't add anything or take away anything. But it is completely illegal to windsurf in Portage Lake. And at that time, the glaciers were, were very close. But you could not do that. So they were, they were representing. Um, an activity that's, that's not legal. Why they had to do it there and not a billion other lakes and, and rivers, I, I don't know. But a bunch of us, we were at our ASMP meetings and we were all commiserating that we weren't chosen to do the assignment and all that. And here they gave it to, to an excellent photographer, but they ended up putting it on the cover and without any disclosure at all. Well, I think there's a minor disclosure uh, in the magazine, but it, it's 99% of the people aren't going aren't gonna to see it. This is a very interesting use of digital um, for religious reasons. Uh, this rabbi argued that he, he should not be able to shave his beard. It's against their, their religious uh, precepts. And eventually this went through the New York Supreme Court and they, they waived the requirement and they, they did it all in Photoshop. So ethical violation? I don't know. Probably not. There's no harm there. A lot of times when you analyze uh, ethical 
considerations in these things, you have to look at the harm. And not just harm as far as legal damages, but just the social harm or whatever other harms there might be besides monetary. So where do we stand? We have this huge gray area, and you have to look at each individual situation uh, themselves. You have different expectations of truth in every media. You have certain standards that are very strict in journalism. And at the other end of the scale, with art, anything goes, theoretically. Um, again, even with art, you wouldn't display certain things in, in uh, the Museum of Modern Art that you might in other places, or vice versa. Um, so you have, to, you have to consider all of those in the light of their particular situation. Um, and of course, your own morals, what you bring to the situation, and if you are viewing these pictures uh, as apart from yourself as you can, you try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, looking at these pictures for the first time, is it going to offend? Is it going to be controversial? Everybody has different excess baggage they brought with them, different views. And the more you can be aware of that and maybe patient with that, I think the less problems you're going to, you're going to come across. Uh, this is a short video. I'm going to see if this works here because I'm going to probably have to turn up my sound. But this was an artist in New York. The gallery exhibit here in New York City is raising... Okay, a lot of eyebrows. Well, it's off-center, but you'll see. Uh, it's an uh, exhibit in New York. And uh, actually, photographs of people going about their daily lives, but some say those images are an invasion of privacy. NBC's Mara Scandal Combo has this story. Mara, good morning. Savannah, good morning. So why are so many people upset about these pictures? Well, it's because the subjects were photographed in secret. Now those personal images aren't just on public display, they're also on sale. They're snapshots of the most intimate and private moments, putting a sleeping child to bed, napping. The problem, the people in these pictures had no idea they were being photographed. I'm upset because a lot of children live in this building. I have children, young children in this building. The pictures were taken by artist Arnie Svensson from his apartment across the street using a telephoto lens. Now the photos are the subject of an exhibit called The Neighbors and are on sale for as much as $8,000 each. I'm sure there's a lot we haven't seen and I don't know what he has on film. And I think that's everybody's big concern is what else is there and what else planning on doing with them. Spence argues he's done nothing wrong, and while no faces are fully visible, residents of the luxury building argue it's an invasion of privacy. I don't feel comfortable knowing that someone was pointing a camera into our places with a telephoto lens. The gallery describes the photos as, quote, social documentation in a very rarefied environment, and fans of the exhibit agree. You can't tell who they are, so I think it's fine. I think they're I love that, too. It's mysterious. I love them. Now, Spencer says he got the idea for these pictures from bird watching, and it's really no different. But he might have a hard time getting new pictures since this exhibit opened. A lot more people around here have been keeping their curtains closed. <laughs> What do you think? How many of you uh, agree with the... Uh, well, I should say, the, the footnote to this is uh, the lawsuits went up to the uh, New York Supreme Court. And uh, before I tell you the punchline, how many of you agree with the photographer that he had the right to shoot and display the pictures without their consent? Nobody. You all agree with most of the people in New York. Well, the photographer won. The New York court sided with him saying that there were no faces, there was no legal uh, violation there, privacy. People had their windows open. They could have closed the curtains, whether or not they knew about it. I think it's a fascinating case. 
because I completely agree with you. I, I would never shoot like that, much less display them. So he, he not only violated the shooting side of it, maybe he manipulated the pictures, but that's a non-issue at this point, but he certainly violated some sort of displaying ethic that might be unwritten. Yeah. Well, it's not a matter of deception, but it's definitely an invasion of privacy, I think. Yes, and, and the legal issues aside, um, we have, I mean, every legal, every law is based in some form of ethical foundation. So you could make that argument, and I'm sure they, they probably did that in court. So whether or not he gets away with it legally, he's not getting away with it morally. And maybe he's shooting himself in the foot. I, I don't know if he has more exhibits in New York or if any uh, art gallery would want to handle his work. He's getting a lot of publicity, and he's getting a lot of money for the, the photos. So somebody's buying it. And if somebody came in from, from wherever, South America, and saw one of his pictures and, and just liked the picture, just like that lady did for no other reason, maybe they'll buy it. And, I, and whether there's ethical violations or not. A lot of times, again, it's, it's, we're shooting, we're deciding between the good of one person or personal expression versus the common good. And nowhere does that come up more than in art circles, having the right to we say freedom of speech, but it's, it's personal expression. Um, and that's not really part of the Constitution, but freedom of speech is. So a lot of those concepts get, get mixed together a little bit. But even when the law decides one thing, it's, it's still unresolved. So these are just some general questions to consider um, as you're shooting, as you're deciding what to manipulate and how, and the effect it might have on either the subjects or the, the community at large that's viewing them, and or how are you going to display these pictures. This was written up as kind of a code of ethics in a journalistic um, context at the Pointer School of Journalism. But I like this because you can ask this all the time, uh, in, in any, wherever you are on the timeline. Um, deciding, uh, for instance, while well, you're looking at yourself first, you know, what, what do you know, what do you want to know about the situation, what do you not care about? Uh, what are your goals? So forth. And kind of moving on through uh, acting responsibly in the community with your pictures. Pictures can be very powerful. And we recognize that. Pictures have, uh, famous images have changed public policy uh, from, the, uh, from the 60s with uh, human rights. Um, so acknowledging the power of a photograph uh, is something to consider right when you're in the act of shooting, not after you've shot. Ethics isn't just between communities, it's within communities. You can have huge disagreement just within small groups within a community, much less between different states, countries, and so forth. Context is everything. Um, very much like learning a foreign language. Uh, those of you who've learned a language or have been traveling, you miss one word. You can totally change the dialogue. It can be very funny at times. It can be very, very insulting. You have to be careful. So even with the context, you have to be aware of the cues, the clues, um, what, what you're shooting in, and the context of the display of the picture afterwards. And context does not have to be physical. And this is, this is what we're kind of learning now because we've had photographs around for a long time. Context can be temporal, it can have to do with time. We tend to think of, of just kind of a narrow frame of time, what's it gonna be like in the next week or two, or the next year or two or three or five. But how about 40 years from now, 50 years from now? Um, sorry. <laughs> this is a little cartoon of the Pilgrims. Religious freedom is my immediate goal, but my long range plan is to get into real estate. You never know how far ahead your image might have influence. And it's very satisfying as a photographer to have something last a long time and affect so many people. Uh, the classic example of this, one of my favorite, uh, does anybody recognize this picture at all? Vietnam era? This is a, a pair of orphan kids. They don't know where the, fam the uh, parents, I believe, were probably killed during the war. Um, a little girl in the box, a little boy. This is on a bathroom floor somewhere in, in Vietnam. And the photographer, Chick Harity, snapped the shot, and it became world 
famous in a short time, as short as it can be in the Vietnam era, until it was published, nobody knew about it. But uh, it engendered tremendous feedback from the public. Uh, orphanages were uh, getting calls all over the country for people wanting Vietnamese children orphaned from the war. He changed probably thousands, maybe millions of lives by the time you add up all the influence of these, these kids as they grew up. He would have never known that at the time. And even at the time when you're confronted as a photographer with a, a sensitive situation like this, some people might be offended. In this case, he was probably alone or whatever. But you might be in a group, uh, and I've had this happen, where there's a handicapped person, or there's something going on that, that you feel a little awkward raising your camera lens to. And you have to weigh these things, whether or not there may be good later, whether there's immediate good now, whether whether you can talk somebody into letting you take their picture. And I say talk somebody in, but it, you know they might not mind that you take the picture. The handicapped person might not mind. Uh, I just about two weeks ago I was in Anchorage, and there was a three-legged dog hopping around, uh, and I was uh, taking the dog's picture. And the owner walked up, and he had only two fingers on one hand. And we started talking, and I find out that he he finds handicapped dogs all over the place. And yes, can I take your picture? Of course, it's not a problem. Other people seeing that may come on the scene and think, hey, wait a minute, did you talk to that guy? Did you talk to them? Did you ask permission of the parents? So you have to be aware a little bit of the perception that might be going on. Um, Forty years later, the photographer got a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Mr. George Bush is in the background, and uh, Chick Harity was on stage, he got this lifetime achievement. And they didn't tell him, but they found the girl. And while he was talking, she walked up through the aisles all the way on stage. And that was the first time they got reunited after that time. They said there wasn't a, a dry eye in the, in the audience. But to be a photographer and have that impact uh, is, is life changing. So thinking of the context and weighing your options as a photographer, it may be worth your while to take some heat to take a picture. It may not be. But this is just one more aspect of the, of the medium that makes it very fulfilling. So to wrap up, we live in a time where you don't have to keep your head in the hole anymore. We've got media everywhere. We've got all kinds of forms of media. Whether you live in a small town or in the middle of nowhere, you can access different forms of media. You don't have to be uh, limited to just the visual. We can click online and get uh, the backstory to an event. You can maybe chat with people online and get a perspective. Uh, you can ask questions. You can find out maybe the, the photos that were rejected for the story. You can get video and audio from the photographer, from eyewitnesses. There's a lot of ways of finding out information before we assume, number one, that we're being misled, or number two, that we're being told the truth. There's a lot of ways of finding out things. Very general guidelines, engage your senses. There's other ways. Pretty soon, I think we're gonna have ways of smelling and tasting online. We already have 3D printers, so there might be ways of us getting much more of a, of a multi-dimensional, multimedia experience beside what we're getting now. Explore your assumptions. Ask what are you assuming about the photographer, about the situation, about the people in the picture. Um, get perspectives of people, of, of the situation. And of course, listening to motivations, considering motivations. I think it's curious that listen and silent have the same letters in them. So we should spend more time listening, really being quiet, the possibilities. And if you remember Tron, uh, those of you that remember video games in their infancy. He was thrust into a video game. He was immersed in this multimedia dimension. And every one of his senses was engaged and heightened all the time. And that's kind of where we are here. And I hope that you can uh, use some of these guidelines and, and discern these things for yourself. So thank you for your time. I'll stay around for questions. Yeah, you gave the example of the little children in Vietnam, and of course, more recently, there's been a little more in uh, 
Aleppo with his bloody head mm -hmm. and a, a year or so before that, the little boy that was drowned on the beach uh, in Turkey or wherever it was, Greece. And, you know, the remains we've seen, what effect those are going to have. I mean, those were very powerful, yes. dramatic uh, photographs. Yeah, there's, there is another one that I debated putting up here. We show a class of, um, in Chicago of a, uh, a fire in a, in a row house. And it shows the, uh, the mother is a black mother and a baby falling off the uh, fire escape. Fire escape disintegrates. And the fire uh, engine had already had the ladder up there, and the fireman was on there, and he, and he was holding the lady. You, you remember this, Mary? You're, yeah, this was very famous. And um, the photographer was snapping pictures, and just when the fireman was ready to bring her on the ladder, the fire escape tore out from under her. He lost both of them. The mother fell down and died. The baby was, uh, was OK. I think the baby had some, some head injuries and a few other injuries. Some, some, I think she was handicapped for life, but able to walk. So there were some issues there. But that moment was captured, and it received a tremendous amount of backlash from the public. They didn't want to see that. They, they complained to the uh, newspaper. The newspaper had to go through all kinds of roundtables with the public saying, no, we feel this is worth it. Uh, the upshot was that it, it created complete um, completely new laws for the construction of fire escapes around the country. So how many lives did they say? We don't know. But the shocking pictures like that, sometimes it takes time for those things to come around. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes we have to shock to, to get things going. I think we all know that. Um, that's just an example of, of good from that. Yeah. There was a, you know, it's interesting too, like during the Iraq war, there was a ban on showing caskets coming back. Yes, yes. And in Vietnam, that was a huge yeah. thing, and people stopping the war. Right. Was seeing and that, those images, and there was a ban on that. Yeah, there's, that's an excellent question, a moral question of whether national, quote, national security is more important than, than how many human lives. How many lives does it take before there's enough of enough or where they say that's enough, let them shoot what they want. We don't want our children to kill them. Sorry, we Well, another subject like that was when the World Trade Center went down. Uh -huh. so they wouldn't show us any pictures of the people jumping out the windows. Yes, yes. I guess there was a few on the TV, just immediate ones, but I don't have a TV. I was at, I was at school. Yes. It was going on, so I never saw any of them, and then they blacked it out, and nobody ever saw them again. You know, the newspapers go through this every day, and, and I've shot for them. I've submitted shots where they've, they've decided, no, we're not going to show that one. The, uh, the last one was, uh, you remember a few years back during the Mount Marathon race, the guy fell yeah. down. He was, he, was, uh, cut it. It, he was in the hospital for, for over a year. He got sent to Utah. Matt McKinney was his name. I happened to be the closest one there shooting and the only shot they ran was mine because I, as soon as I realized he wasn't coming out I saw him jump off and then he got hidden by some rocks and uh, he wasn't coming out and I heard the crowd gasp and so, so I, I went up to where it was and I got a few shots off before I put everything down and we helped him down into the ambulance after that but he was in bad shape and uh, I took about maybe three or four shots and they looked at them all and said okay this one has too much blood uh, we don't want to show his face. Uh, you know, there's a point where they say, okay, kids are going to see this. What are we going to do with the kids? Uh, maybe that has to do with, with the World Trade Center. They don't want kids maybe seeing a picture of somebody falling on the pavement. Uh, those, are, those are tough questions. How much will they show of an image that gets the message across? How shocking does it have to be before it elicits the response? Well, I've shot for magazines for hunting and fishing and hunting and fishing magazines don't want to show gory they don't want any blood on the fish or they if you have if you have an animal you don't want any blood or guts or anything because they don't because right. people have a bad view or, of that or they'll so, photoshop it out yeah they, they will do that or they'll have a little bit just enough to show yeah, yeah i think dave said that for uh they were not publishing photographs of the casket coming back that was that was not Vietnam, that was Iraq. No, That's what said, I said. Yeah, oh, I thought you said. As opposed to Vietnam, yeah. where they showed them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and that happens all the time. Uh, the Obama administration has been very tight against photographers, unfortunately. They, it's been one of the most difficult administrations 
to uh, have have some journalistic freedom. Unfortunately. Um. Yeah, you might have said this, but I didn't quite hear it. But um, you had mentioned that um, try attempt, you know, it's ideally we shouldn't remove things from a photograph unless maybe it's too much of a distraction mm -hmm. from the message of the photograph. But um, a few years ago, I learned about uh, that there was that incident in a there was a school in the '60s, a college, and the army had gotten called over there because of the riots. And there's that real famous photograph of the girl, and she's down on the ground, and she's like screaming. And they had the, they had edited the picture because there was like a, uh, a piece of a fence that directly stuck out from her head, and they removed it because it was abstraction. But uh, my question to you about that is, uh, in a, if a situation like that, uh, removing something that may seem as abstraction, do you think it possibly affects the um, right. uh, ethical guidelines, the impact? Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent question because they go through this uh, in journalistic circles all the time. And the question is, if you remove a peripheral artifact in a, in a, in a picture for a newspaper or some, uh, some sort of journalism or documentary that is predicated on the expectation of absolute truth, is that such a big deal? The answer most of the time is yes. They don't even want to be part, they don't want to get into that controversy. So most, almost every newspaper or a major newspaper, let me put it that way, or Associated Press or Reuters, uh, they will have very strict code of ethics. You do not remove anything, they will not remove anything, no matter how small. And there have been pictures, there's one, uh, there was an interview, and I forget who they were interviewing, and he had a uh, soft drink on the table. And, you know, a lot of times they don't want the brand name of a soft drink in, in a newspaper or, or situation. I can understand that. They took the whole the soft drink out, and they got a lot of heat for it after, when people found that out. Because where does it end? It's a slippery slide, and they don't want to be part of that discussion. They don't want to lose people over something that's mundane like that. Uh, to me, it's not worth uh, losing that credibility, translating into advertising dollars in their publication, when that starts happening. Because then people will cross over and say, hey, if I don't believe the newspaper, why should I believe the ads? I mean, it's a little crazy, but that's, that's the way uh, these discussions go. And it's not worth thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars for them to do that. And that's just that part of the argument. There might be every other argument, uh, what photographers are going to lose credibility for shooting with a, a, a publication that might uh, deceive, mislead, whether it's on purpose or not. We can really talk about purposeful versus uh, not purposeful, but really, uh, really it doesn't matter in the eye of a viewer who is saying, uh, if they modify that, how can I believe anything? So, it's a tough situation now. What if they just like, blurred the background a little bit, or maybe blurred that, they, you know, made it so that it was, yes. just by the lighting and stuff, but didn't take it out but made it so it didn't show quite so strong. Would that be considered manipulated? That's a good question. Again, it's na nailing Dell to a wall. Uh, yes, it would be, but would it be distasteful? Would it lose readers? I don't know. Um, it, it might, because if it, uh, again, like the Newsweek, ed uh, the Time editor, the Newsweek editor said that they didn't modify it enough. If, if somebody's very skilled at it, yeah, you won't know if it was actually shot that way. Um, they can do selective focus in the camera, or they can do it in Photoshop, and you won't know at all unless you've got a trained eye. There's a very good book by uh, uh, Dr. Henry Haney Farad, a uh, professor of physics at um, uh, Dartmouth, I think. He wrote The Reconfigured Eye, and I think it's in, in the bookstores here. And they can tell, down to half a pixel, whether a pixel has been modified. There are ways of measuring the contrast and the angle of light compared to every other pixel. And they, will, they are the experts, forensic experts, they can be called into court and say, yes, this picture's been modified. 50 years ago, we can tell. So it's, it's, they can prove something. Now, whether or not that has an impact on viewers or, or it's a peripheral thing, I, I don't know. But again, most, most of the time, uh, whether it's magazine or newspaper, we don't care if National Enquirer modifies things. We pretty much give them as much rope as they want. So it's, it's kind of, Kind of a little gray scale there that, that you're going to have to decide who gets who gets a little leeway and who doesn't. A photograph that we both know 
did a lot of photographer from you on Arctic Star. And I put together a thing on uh, color and diversity in an Arctic Star. But he took some of the photographs and changed them. I mean, he said, you want more red in it? <laughs> and if we had to do it over again, I would have had him take the first picture, the un 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 and then I take the modified picture. And I got the point where I didn't know whether some of these was a real thing or the modified. Interesting. But, so, would the color matter in a scientific sense? Well, it, uh, some of this I didn't hear. I said, they don't look this. They're not this red. Yeah, they're not that red. So, but at that time, it wasn't for publication. It wasn't going in, in a, uh, a journal or anything. No, no. There was no money involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would definitely make it uh, unethical. But, yeah. but if there's no money, then you get a little more leeway. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a minor use, and, you, and you, it, it could come back at some point. You don't know where those might end up. And uh, who knows? Live with it. You might mention that the next time you talk. I might talk to him about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This may be peripheral, but in determining responsibility for one's influence, uh -huh. is that if a magazine looks at a picture and says, yes, that could hurt children's psyches that have nightmares, we can't use that, how responsible are they? Or determine what somebody else might think? That is not a peripheral question. That's a brilliant yeah. question. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, it depends whether you're talking uh, responsibility in a legal sense versus no, a moral ethical. Ethical. ethical sense. Well, in, in an ethical sense, that's going to have to be debated. Probably, maybe everybody here has a slightly different view about it. Uh, in this country, because we have such a punitive legal system, uh, the, the legal question would, would have to be debated in a, far beyond our, our intelligence. But uh, we tend to look for blame elsewhere. And, and usually when they're looking for blame, they're looking for money. But when you, if you're talking about a, a, child, a child being influenced like that, well, a lot of times they would either have to probably do focus groups. You know, a lot of times magazines, even newspapers sometimes uh, do test runs and, and do you know, split covers or they, they, they split them up and, and do them in focus groups and, and get some general opinions. Or they have their committee meetings and they, and they trust their, their group, whatever it is. So I, I can't answer the question for you, but I, it's a great question because uh, how much of the blame, or not blame, let's say how responsible are the parents even for letting their children see something that maybe could already be restricted in, in use in some form. I certainly wouldn't put a controversial picture like that on a cover. I mean, certainly they could be held to a higher standard. Covers are considered advertising, even though they're in a, in a, a journal of some sort, or editorial use. Uh, so they can definitely be held liable for some sort of, of um, misuse on, a, on an advertising cover that, that people can't help but see. Um, but beyond that, they would probably have to get, you know, half a dozen child psychologists and they'd have to agree and disagree and, and decide if there's a legal issue in there. Uh, and uh, personally, I, I, I hold less responsibility uh, for the magazines, not because I'm a photographer, but it's very hard if, if somebody says, oh, you, you destroyed my child, they saw that picture and they're never the same, they had to go through therapy, and you know, you'd have to go through a lot to prove that there wasn't some pre-existing condition or something else going on that uh, if most other people might be shocked but basically unaffected, then, then that's the ballpark you'd have to be playing with. Yes? The photo that does get published uh, in a magazine or something, let's say, theoretically, if, uh, like that there was holding a uh, Coca-Cola. Um, hey, Coca-Cola didn't like, obviously like that. Mm -hmm. um, could the photographer get in trouble for that? Well, that's a good question. Generally, um, for newsworthy events, you're protected um, by the Constitution, freedom of speech, more or less. And you're protected in the sense that uh, if it's, if it's an event that's happening in the public, you don't need permission. You don't even need permission, permission uh, to show somebody's face. You're in a public event, and, and this is a free society. They don't have to be out in public. As far as logos and companies that might be offended or associated with something like that, no, they, they don't have a choice um, in that matter. 
Now, if they want to make an argument that you're in some sort of, of uh, private venue or that it was uh, some sort of non-journalistic situation, then you, you'd be in the corporate advertising realm. And they could certainly make a case that you needed permission there uh, to use their product to promote whatever might be promoting and they don't want to be associated with a certain whatever concept. But most of the time, and this has to do with model releases, you know, uh, property releases, you know, if there's ever any, any question while we're shooting, I, I, get, I get model releases. Uh, rarely have I gotten property releases um, unless I'm, uh, because if, if you're shooting on a private property, usually I've already got the assignment or contract that, that gives me permission to be, here, be there. Um, but uh, you're, you're okay as the photographer as long as you've got the paper trail going if you're on a private situation. Don't worry about news scenes, free country. Look at all the iPhones, the magazines and, and newspapers are using iPhones. You know, people can't be very selective with that. Um, and again, they have the option if they really wanted to, to, to blur things out if they, if they had to. Yeah. So where's the line of that guy that took the neighbors was saying that was an art piece. Right. So if you take a photograph and you play with it a little bit, but it's still clear who's in it, but you played with it, you've done something to it to turn it into an art piece, you know, um, then what? Well, the, he knew what he was doing, right? no doubt about it. He didn't show any faces, number one. If he would have shown faces, he would have been in a different ballpark. Then you may be looking at an invasion of privacy system. Even though they had their windows open, or yeah, they had their windows open, they theoretically had the choice even if they didn't know that he was shooting. So other than that, anything under art would be fine. Now the question really is, how did he display it? Because if he would have maybe displayed it in a place that said, look, this has pictures of your neighbors, uh, entry is restricted as long as you agree uh, that you don't mind and you will not hold your life. There's a lot of ways he can, he can approach that. But I'm sure he had plenty of legal advice for this situation, and, and it worked. But if you're out shooting pictures and say you went to Soldatna Stars football game, or you're someplace where you and you, you know, see an interesting person, and then you use that person in an art piece, do you have to find that person and get their permission? Generally, in a no. In public place when you took the picture? Yeah, the short answer is no. Um, the long answer is. It would be nice to do that. And many times I've, I've gone uh, retroactively and found somebody. I would usually at the time, mostly when I'm traveling, you know, I'll, I'll try to get names and phone numbers or names and contacts and emails whenever possible. It's a great introduction just to meet new people. I mean, just to sit there and uh, on a beach one time I did it. Uh, this is one of the only times I've been refused a picture, but I was, I was on a beach somewhere in Mexico and, and a uh, nice couple, they had their, their chairs kind of in the surf, you know, and they were sitting on the surf, and the sand was coming up, and they were having fun, or the water was coming up, and they were having a blast, and, and I took a few pictures, and they, they knew I was there, I was about as far as I am to you. I said, okay, I'm going to go up and ask them, because this is just too good. Because, you know, you risk a little embarrassment or whatever, because it's worth it when you got a good picture. And I went up, I said, well, do you mind? I've been shooting pictures, you guys are having a lot of fun. Um, I do shoot professionally, and, and if there's a chance that it gets used, I'll be able to send you print, I'll be able to send you um, blah, blah, blah. And, he, and the response was, well, uh, I'm a lawyer, and I probably prefer not. <laughs> 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 exactly. How's, I didn't ask her how Mrs. was. Uh, what, what about those pictures that were taken of the, uh, in, on the Indian land, of the dogs attacking people and uh, break? Well, it depends how, how they were taken because on that they may have needed pro uh, uh, property releases or... But they were on the Indian land. Right, right. But sometimes those, I don't know the legalities, you know, quite frankly, of, of the Indian land, but sometimes there's restrictions there that they are, they are a sovereign nation and, and the government has respected that. That doesn't mean you can go on Indian land and murder someone, so there's a lot of fine lines there. Um, but in general, if you're in an event that anybody can go to, you're covered. Uh, almost anything you shoot is fair game. And then it becomes the issue of whoever you're sending it to or you're displaying it, what they're willing to put up with as far as backlash. So it might not be a legal issue, it's just we really want to deal with.
letters and, and phone calls and, and loss of future, you know, revenue or whatever it might be. You know, that whole thing went viral too. Yeah, yeah, it did, and I, I don't know what the result was from there, but uh, uh, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes they are going to stand on their on their on their ideals and and go for it. They were willing to put up with it because it's it's not going to be tolerated. <coughs> So, anyway, thanks for coming again. I will still be here for a little bit and have some questions.